Hello and welcome to Commodore 128 assembly language programming. Um, before we get back to the worm program I want to do a little bookkeeping here, or a little housekeeping. Um, I wanted to mention there is a Commodore 128 subreddit and I check in there at least daily so um, if you want to discuss these videos or anything else um, having to do with the 128 um, that's a good place for it. Um, there's not a lot of traffic there right now so it could always use more and uh, be on topic there and it's generally I, if you're not familiar with reddit it's a it's a better place for ongoing discussions than uh, YouTube comments just because you have more more ability to format things like if you're going to put in code snippets or anything like that um, I haven't linked to my videos there because I'm not sure you're supposed to link to your own content um, at reddit but if anybody else wants to I certainly wouldn't mind and uh, I'll take questions there. Um, there's also an assembly language group which is just for assembly language in general um, and 6502 stuff there is discussed there along with you know all, all other processors. Um, so I tend to check in there too. There's also a Commodore 64 group um, but since the 128 group exists um, I think they prefer to keep the 64 group to just 64 stuff. I wanted to mention um, RL wrap and talk a little bit. I don't think I've talked before about how I actually do this, how I use the monitor. Um, but the the Vice emulator has um, has a built-in monitor that you can just open up, and I can't show you that because of the way OBS captures Windows. But um, you can just open a monitor within Vice, but it's it has a pretty small font by default, and I didn't there doesn't seem to be anything in the settings that change that so what I'm using is what they call the um, remote monitor server and you enable that under file monitor settings and once you enable that then you can tell net to this server that it runs and that's what I do so I just tell net to localhost uh, 6510 is the default port you can change that in the settings as well um, but I I had noticed and you might have noticed in previous videos that um, I was having to retype things because it doesn't the the emulator the monitor doesn't have a built-in read line function to let you go back to lines you've done before it doesn't have a history function um, RL wrap is a is a little utility that you can wrap things in that gives you that and so if I wrap the telnet in RL wrap then once I get in there um, remember where I'm located then I can just redo you know commands by control P going up or arrow keys I suppose so that's that's a handy thing um, a commenter on YouTube Glenn Gray mentioned that I'd run into a couple situations where it seemed like the randomness wasn't randomizing um, I was just getting the same number over and over and that got me to thinking and I, th I think the situation in all those cases was that I was I was not setting the bank and so I didn't have the IO blocked in the block banked in um, at some point I'm gonna do a video just on banking in the 128 because it is a little complicated um, but basically the since the randomness comes from the SID chip the sound chip that's in the IO block at D thousand and you have to have that banked in if you're gonna draw numbers from it and I wasn't always doing that um, the monitor, the vice monitor, has its own bank command, but what that that doesn't change the bank that the computer that the that the 128 itself is looking at. That just changes the bank that the monitor is looking at. And I think I was mixing up the two, um, and so I wasn't always in the bank that has I/O mapped in when I thought I was. So you deal with that by just setting the bank at the beginning of your program to. Um, load A with zero, store that into FF zero zero zero. That banks in um, the I/O block along with all the ROM that's in the system. Well, not all the ROM because some of it overlaps, but basically it banks in the kernel. It also banks in basic. So if you if you need more space, you're going to have to change that. But that's a good that's a good default to start with, and then you be sure you get actual random numbers. Um, and I think I did that already in. In, uh, the worm program yeah so that's why it hasn't been a problem since I did that um, I just don't think I realized at the time that I'd fixed it okay so 
what to do this time. Um, we've got a few things. Basically, the, when we finished up last time, the game was working. The worm moves around. You know, you can steer it around. It, when it collides with itself or with the wall, the, the, the game ends. It breaks out. Um, the worm gets longer when it's supposed to. doesn't get longer when it's not supposed to. All that good stuff. So, what are some other things we want to do? Well, a simple thing is changing the colors. Um, we don't necessarily have to change the colors, but let's do it just because we can. Um, if you look at the the programmer's reference guide, you'll see right in here. Uh, here we are. There are a couple of registers for border color at D020 and then background color at D021. Now there are three other background colors. Those don't come into play until you're in multicolor mode. So we're just in normal text character mode. So the only one that matters is the first one here. So we'll set the border color in the background color. Um, I think we'll just set them to black for now. Uh, so let's be let's be organized about it and let's go up here and add a couple of values border color uh, I guess I'll just use the whole word border color I said is it D020 and background color is at D021 let's put in a couple of colors black and again this is a chart you can find a chart of the colors in the book um, black is zero, white is one, and let's see, let's find one more color. Uh, that's the other screen. Okay, there's the, there's the chart of colors. So let's use cyan, it'll be three. Um, yeah. So we'll just um, have a few colors by name that we can use. So here at the beginning, after we set the, um, after we set things up, let's uh, load A with black, store that into border color, and then store it also into background color. All right. Now, that takes care of the border in the background, but what about the foreground characters? Well, every cell on the screen, you're, you're, you, know, you have a thousand cells on the screen for text characters. Every one also has its own foreground color. And those are stored in something called color RAM, which is at, I'll keep doing that, which is at, D800. So, <clears throat> so to fill that up, um, so at color RAM you have a thousand cells in a row, just like you have at screen RAM, except these hold the color um, for the foreground instead of the text characters. So at 400, starting at 400, you have a thousand characters that hold the actual character value. Starting at D800 for color RAM, you have a thousand values that hold the the color for that uh, for that character. Now you only have 16 colors, um, and those only take four bits. So only the low four bits of each of of each of those matter um, in the normal text character mode. The high four bits are just ignored. Um, and apparently in the 128 there is it is actually a separate chip that this is on um, from what I could figure out from my reading um, and there are actually it actually exists in both banks bank 0 and bank 1 but for now we just we just need to worry about the one that the one that we're dealing with um, so to fill that we want to fill it basically the same way that we fill the screen with spaces to start out so right here we jump to fill screen now fill screen is in this other file that we include text screen lib 
So let's do another routine called fill color. And let's have it fill color RAM with the value in A. So we just need to change these all to color RAM. And that should do it. So we've got a fill color routine now that'll fill the color RAM with whatever value is in A when we call it. And it just uses the same functionality that fill screen uses to run through those thousand spaces. So let's come back here then. So before we fill the screen, let's load A with our foreground color. Let's use white. And then jump to subroutine, fill fill color, or did I call it fill color or fill colors? Okay, fill color. Um, let's call it fill color RAM, or I'm, that's going to confuse me. I won't be able to remember whether it's plural or singular. Fill color RAM. All right. Okay, so we fill the color, we set this, we set the border color and background color to, to black, and then we fill the color RAM for the foreground with white. So that's going to set up our colors. <clears throat> um, okay, let's go ahead and see how it looks now. Uh, all right, so our code then we're loading in at 1300. All right, so you can see how it looks. Um, and we can just make sure everything still works because I haven't tried this since last week when we finished up. It looks more like a real game for whatever reason in uh, black and white than it did in green and light green. Um, okay. So that's fun. Um, So that is one small task down. Uh, let's mark that off. All right. We, I don't think we're going to display a score during the game because there's nowhere to put it without shrinking the game board. And it's already small enough as it is. So let's call this display a score after game. And then also ask if play again. All right. We already I already swapped the body and the head character from last time to make the, the head character a little bigger than the body, so I think that's fine. I don't know if we if we need to make custom head and body characters for this game. I mean, it's it's pretty basic. Um that might be something better saved for the next one. Um that brings us to the keyboard routine first thing I want to do is allow you to hold down the key because it's pretty annoying when you're going all the way across the screen to have to tap 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 and not be able to just hold it down okay the reason holding it down doesn't work is that we fixed it so that it doesn't and there was a reason for that at the time um, because basically if you just let it take key presses as fast as it can get them it goes way too fast and so what we did was we put in here load a with key press compare to 88 branch if equal back to here or well, wait a second no branch if equal back up to here to wait for key get another one and so as long as it was 88 which is the which is the value you get when there's nothing pressed it branches up here but then as soon as it comes through meaning that it got something it would save that and then it would wait until you got 88 again meaning that you would let up on the key so if we take this whole section out because what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're pushing A on the stack and then we're waiting until the key is released and then pulling A back off the stack and returning so if we just take that whole section out now you can hold it down but let's see what happens. Uh, 
Uh, what I, oh, I've got to load the game again. Dummy. Okay. So now what happens as soon as I hit H to go left, boom, it runs into the side because it's taken it's taking keys that fast. All right, so that's not going to work. I've got to we've got to have a delay somewhere is what it boils down to. So if we think about where we want to delay, we don't want to delay here. We don't want to delay in between the key press and the thing moving on the screen. That would look weird. If you had to press a key and then it didn't move on the screen for a part of a second, that would look weird. So I would say we want to delay after the move, after it moves the worm. So if we come up here and think about where that is, here's our main loop. So um, let's see. And each of these, okay, yeah, so each of these jumps back up to main loop after it does its thing, so we would have to stick the delay into each one if we put it here in main loop. So maybe we could put it at the end of print head. Say so print head is the, print head isn't, doesn't have the best name anymore because now it does more than printing the head. Now it prints the head and the tail moves everything around. But I would say, we could put our delay right here. Let's let's try to get a delay of one second. All right. So how can we delay one second? Well, um, One way would be to just put in a loop that runs enough times that it's going to take about a second. Um, so, let's see what sort of available, let's see. Um, Let's put a couple of addresses at the end here. Actually, put those there. Okay, so what I did there was I just put a couple of, I just assigned a couple of memory locations or allocated a couple of memory locations right at the end of the program with the labeled delay. Um, so what we can do here is, let's see, load A was zero, store that into delay and store it in delay plus one then increment delay and let's see we'll branch if not equal back up to there and then increment delay plus one and branch if not equal back up to there and then return okay let's see what that's going to do for us um, actually this can just be a negative or minus and this can be the minus that they branch up to. So this is going to increment delay branch if it's not equal to zero back up to here. So it's going to do this loop 256 times. And every time it falls through, then it's going to increment delay plus one and branch if not equal back up to here. And so it's going to do that 256 times. So this is going to run 256 times 256 loops, that's 65,000 loops basically, 65,500 loops. And each one is going to take, you know, a few microseconds. Um, so you could multiply that out and do the math and figure out what it's going to take. I'm just going to try it. Let's 
Okay. That time I pressed H just kind of as quick as I could, and it went a few spaces. It went five, five spaces, I think. Hmm, that's interesting. Seems like it went really quick the first time, but then after that, it's taken more time. Oh, that was interesting. I don't know if you could see if you could catch that in the video, but when I hit a number, it lurched forward. There, let's go up and get this three. So it is delaying. It's maybe even a little longer than I'd, than I'd like, but. Um, Watch what happens when I press when I press the three. As soon as I hit it, boom! It went ahead and it, it didn't delay then. So we got to think about the logic of why wasn't it delaying at that point. Um, okay. When it hits a number, so right here it jumps to subroutine collision. So printhead jumps to collision. And that checks things. And let's see if it hits something. So here it compares to a space. And if it's not equal to a space, it jumps ahead to here. And at that point, it adds to more body, jumps to subroutine, place a num, and then returns. Otherwise, it just returns. So place a num. work at it from the other end. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's right here. Basically, we can return from printhead in two different places. There's one right there, and then there's the other one at the end. I stuck it in before this one, so it's delaying before this return. It's not delaying before this return. This return is the one that happens if you don't, let's see, yeah, because right here is where it decrements more body, so this is where it's deciding whether it needs to make the worm longer. If it needs to make it longer, then it, re then it ends up returning here, otherwise it comes down through this stuff and moves the tail and then returns here. So what I need to do is put that delay in before both returns. Now, let's see, I might have another issue. Because right here I'm pulling A back off the stack. My jump to subroutine clobbers A. So my, you know, my delay one set clobbers A because it uses it to set those timers. So the question is, is, is that going to be a problem? And I'm thinking it probably is because printhead saves A. Yeah, printhead saves A and it needs to be able to give it back at the end. So I need to change delay one sec so that it doesn't use A. It'd be the simplest way to handle this. And since nothing here is, is dealing with X, it doesn't look like I, it would hurt anything to use X. Let's just use X here instead. And that's simple enough to do. All right. Now it's delaying a little bit long, so um, what we can do is just kind of fiddle with the numbers on it. Um, since it's incrementing, let's let's cut it in half. That'll really cut it in fourths because we're cutting both loops in half. So let's set it to one fourth the amount of delay and see if that's too see if that's too fast. I think it probably will be, but all right. 
So if I hit H, if I hold it down, doop, 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 doop. Eh, not bad. I think I might like to make it a little faster yet. Let's increase this to B0. Actually, that might have been smaller than like, here. I think the assembler makes things decimal unless you specify hex, and so that was probably only 5.0 and hex, not 8.0. Let's try that again with it in hex. Mm, seems about, about the same, I guess. Um, actually, you know what? If I'm not going to use zero always as my index, I'm going to have to make that a little bit more complicated because here we're setting it to 80. We're setting delay and delay 1 to 80. And so the first time through here, it's only going to increment it 80 times in, in hex. But then after that, each loop through, it's going to it's going to increment it, or it's going to be starting at zero again. So what I need to do, let's see. This one needs to be, this one needs to loop back to there. And or actually, well, X isn't changing, so we can just loop it to there. And the other one needs to loop back to there. Now let's make sure that's right. No, 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 no. Sorry. That one's right. And that one needs to be there. Okay, let's think this through. So Okay, here's what I I I've got to do it like that. All right. So what happens here is it gets in here, they're both set to 80, it increments this one 80 times, branching if not equal back up to there, then it falls through, increments this one, branches if not equal back up to here, and then stores 80 back into the first delay, which causes it to loop again, so that seems correct. All right. There, that's more what I was shooting for. All right, so now I can scoot across the screen fairly quick. And I'm kind of looking for a bigger number here so we can make sure that it also delays when you hit a number. Yeah, okay. That's what we're shooting for. That's that's fine. It could be a, maybe a little faster, but I think that'll be fine. <clears throat> to make it faster, just need to make this number a little bigger. If we went with like A0. There, it's some noticeably faster. So, we can just tweak that number. And again, you can still, you can tap the, well, that's almost fast enough now that it's, it's hard for me to tap it and just get one key. Basically, we're writing our own keyboard um, gathering routine, and it's, I'm sure you could get more complex with it. Um, okay, let's just leave it at 80 and call that good. All right, back to here. We've allowed it holding down the key, 
Now the other thing is auto key pressing if you're too slow. Generally in this game it doesn't let you just sit and think about it for too long. It wants you to have to keep moving and if you don't then it uses the last key that you pressed and just goes ahead and moves another step for you. To do that we're going to have to do a couple of things. One is we're going to have to save the key that you last pressed somewhere. Um, so we're going to need a location. Call it last key. Um, we'll put this at FE in zero page. We don't have a don't have anything there. Or do it doesn't appear like. And then when we get a key, we can store it there. So we'll store it in last key. All right. Now the question is, now this is where it's going to get, this is, I, I haven't worked out in my head how to do this at all. Um, how do we expand on this? so that instead of waiting forever it just waits a certain amount of time we can't just put a delay loop in here because we need to we kind of need to check two things at a time um, how long we've delayed and also what key has been pressed if any so we could we could have a loop but um, we want it to be responsive enough to respond as soon as you as soon as you do press a key we don't want a loop sitting there for half a second and then check to see if you press the key we want it watching for your key all the time but we also want it to have a timer of sorts going so that if you haven't pressed anything in a certain amount of time it can go ahead and do it for you um, think here and one other thing we don't want to have to move until we start we don't want to as soon as we run the game we don't want it to take off running without us so at the beginning right here let's store zero into last key the keys none of the keys equal zero so we'll be able to check against zero to see if we've pressed a key yet That'll only matter for the very first press, but it will matter then. Um, okay. There's a, there's a couple possible ways to do this. One is to use the actual timer that's in the machine. Um, and that's probably the way, I'm, the way I'm inclined to go. we look at let's look at the book look at the memory map here um, at a something a zero in, in zero page there is a three byte time counter which keeps a 24-hour clock in 1 60th of a second so it's a it's a three byte value and the last byte at A2, I'm pretty sure, um, is the one that tracks the 60th of a second. So let's say we wanted to have a one second delay maximum on your key press. We could watch that value and after 60 ticks go by, then we could go ahead and press a key. Um, let's see. Yeah, here we are. I think Okay, now the time of day clock is a different thing. Um Okay, that's just an example. Oh, I know it. 
It's also called the Jiffy Clock at times. Um, yeah, real time Jiffy Clock. This is also the clock that that runs the interrupts that break in every sixtieth of a second. Um, it's I think it's fifty times a second in European systems because they're different electronics. Um, I thought it was mentioned more times than that in the book. Maybe they sometimes they spelled it Jiffy like that. Yeah, uh, that's. Okay. I just want to know which one is the last byte, which one is the first byte. Um, and none of them are telling me. What was that last one? Decrementing Jiffy register. Hmm. At A one D. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, here let's just let's just look at them. That's probably the best way to find out. All right, A zero to A two in zero page. Right now it says O one B four seven eight. If I, um, the monitor freezes the system. So if I exit the monitor for a second, come back, 01B4A0. Okay, so the last one is the, is the smallest one, is the one that's counting 60ths of a second. So at A2 is um, the one we care about. So here's what we'll do. Here's, here's my first idea. Is let's say Adra Jiffy's is it A2? Um, so here's what let's do. First of all, let's put a dash there to we can branch back to so we can set this up first. We're going to load A with 60. Well, um, Uh, 3B, I guess. I gotta stop and think. Um, I'm oh, sorry, 3C would be 60 in hexadecimal. 48 plus 12, yeah. Store that into. Or let's see. No, that's. I gotta stop and think about this. That thing is gonna be incrementing. A 60 is gonna be incrementing once every 60th of a second. So if I wanna count. 60 times, I need to subtract 256 minus 60, um, which is 100 and um, 256 minus 60 would be 196, right? Yeah. I don't know why that's giving me trouble for a second there. Um, 196, so in hex, that's C4. So if we start the counter at C4, if we say, okay, you're now at C4, now count up, then 60 60ths of a second later, or one second later, it's going to hit zero, and that can be the thing we branch on. So C4 and we'll store that into Jiffy's and that sets up our timer, basically. So now, we'll load A with a key press, compare it to 88, and then we would branch, if not equal, back up to here, but we also want to check out our Jiffy's counter. So we're going to have to change how this works. So what we're going to want to do is branch, if not equal, ahead Otherwise, we need to load A from Jiffy's, and if it's zero, then what? Do, then we want to do certain things. Otherwise, let's see. Let's see. if we branched, if we got a character here, 
So if it was not equal to 88, we wanted to come up, come forward to here. <coughs> Excuse me. And store it as the last key in return. Otherwise, we want to load A from the Jiffy's counter and branch if not equal to zero back up to there and get the and check the key press again. If it falls through here, then let's see. So if it loads A from Jiffy's and Jiffy's is up to zero, then we want to load A from last key. And then, well, storing it back into last key is obviously a waste of time, but we need to get A out of the last key. And we could stick another return right here to save three cycles. It's probably not worth wasting a byte to save three cycles. So let's just do that. So the way this works, it comes in here, it sets up the counter by saying, give us 60 more jiffies while we, while we wait for a key press. Then it checks the key press, if it's not an empty, if it's not empty, 88 means empty. So if it's not empty, it branches ahead to here, stores the key press into last key, and returns with the key press in A. That's that's correct. Otherwise, it loads A from Jiffy's, and if it's if it's not if the Jiffy's counter hasn't run out yet, it branches back up here, checks for the next key press. If it has gotten to zero, then it says, okay, this person hasn't pressed a key yet, but time is up, so we're going to load A from last key, store that away, and return. Okay, I think that's all, I think the logic all there works out. All right, let's see what happens. So, pressing. And I did forget one thing. I forgot about making sure that it's going to start out um, correct. Although that actually fixes itself um, because at the beginning, um, since last key is equal to zero, it doesn't match any of our um, it doesn't match any of our key presses that we check against, so it actually works fine. Now this should run into the side and end the game. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's try one more time and make sure that it still lets me move around. But as soon as I stop moving, it should take over and move for me. Yep. Okay. So that works, I would say, rather nicely. Um, worm still extends so I can move around I can hold it down but as soon as I stop then the one second timer kicks in and it does seem to be working at about one second we could make it faster or slower just by changing them the number of jiffies there um, that it has to wait but I'm gonna I think one second is I think one second is about what the FreeBSD version of it does so I think that'll be just fine okay um, all right, so back here we've got auto key press working now. So now we come to display a score after the game. All right. Now we have the score in length, so that's that part is easy enough. Um, we've we've got that value, a 16-bit value, so we just need to be able to print a 16-bit value. Um, And we already have code to do that, which, let's see here. Um, what did we use that in? I don't even remember now which, which uh, bit of code I, I think I did anyway.
that doesn't print anything out. That just divides, which it'll, it'll need that, but that's not um, that's not the whole thing. And that's not either. I could have sworn I had written something that that printed out a number. I know I did. Where is it here? Oh, project, no. Oh, it's just in Maine, okay. I guess I wasn't trying to name things intelligently yet at that point. I'm not even sure if this was... when this was that I did this. Um, so, print 32-bit. This is what happens when you don't uh, document things well enough. I should have some comments here telling me how to use this, but I didn't write this intending. I guess I wasn't intending to use this as um, as a routine for other programs to use. Um, Yeah. <clears throat> okay, yeah, there's div 10, so divide it by 10. So print 32 bit. We only have a 16 bit number, but that that can be I guess the thing to do would be to really quickly change this to print or create another one called um, print 16 bit. Um, let's do this. Let's write this to print numbers and we'll turn this into a library, you know, library file real quick here. So we don't want we don't want that um, let's see how was I doing this print 16 bit sixteen. I'm going awfully quickly here. I'm probably going to break something, but um, Yeah, plus I'm using the kernel routine here, which I don't really I don't really want to use kernel routines in this program in this game. Um, let's think about how to do this. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna need to repurpose this. I wasn't really thinking about this aspect of it, so I'm a little in the weeds here right now, but I think I'll need to repurpose this more than I realized to turn it into more of a generic print any 16-bit number anywhere in memory. This thing is this thing is hard-coded because this was just a, um, it was an example at the time, but it has the number hard-coded at, at this location, my number. Um, it needs to be able to feed in the address through registers. Um, 
it needs to be able to print to a particular location instead of just using the kernel routine. So let's let's make that a note for next time. that's going to be a whole, I mean, not a whole hour of us in itself, but it's going to take a little time of its own. So we can do that. Um, let's see. And ask if play again. Um, Okay, so play again is going to come in in the collision routine, I suppose. Or well, I guess actually here at end game, we jump to end game when we have when we end the game when we run into something. So this is going to have to print um, on the screen. Would you like to play again? So what I'm thinking, and I guess we'll we'll figure out the number printing part later. But for now, we can print. Um, some stuff on the screen. So let's go to the end here and let's say end message equal or end message and we'll put it in Petsky which just means Commodore bytes so it'll turn this into Commodore bytes. Play again And the zero at the end is just a way to end the um, the line. So what we need then in end game is to put that on the screen. And so what we want to do is let's load y with zero. And let's see. We want to load a from end message comma y and store it let's say at 500 comma y increment y branch if not equal to zero and that's the thing that's watching for the well then wait a second sorry increment y and jump back up to here which is going to be right here and in between here then we need to check or well right here we need to check for um, actually this can, this can be a branch if not equal be a, it's a little faster than a jump I believe um, branch if equal because it's it's loading a from end message so when it hits that zero at the end of end message we want it to branch out of this and so we'll branch ahead to plus and the plus then has a re return okay and I guess well let, let's keep our break there alright for now because a, re a return there is going to goof things up because of the way we've got some nested jumps that'll be something else we've got to fix so let's try that I'm just going to let it run into the wall here real quick. Ah, okay. Um, it printed the stuff on the screen, but you can see it printed it in weird characters. Um, I guess that's because I used Petsky. And yeah, that's that's why I'm, I'm, I used the characters that it would use to um, feed them through the kernel routine. <clears throat> I think that's probably what I want. SCR for screen. I could look it up um, in the assembler manual. 
I think that's right. Let's try it, and then I'll look it up if that doesn't fix it. There it went. Play again, other than the capital P, because in uh, on the Commodore you've got... It, basically, you've got two character sets you can be using at any given time. The main character set has just capital letters and the graphics characters, like the, like the circle that we're using for the body of the worm. Um, the other set has capital and small letters, so the, the default set is like that. So, um, if we want all capital letters for now, we just make this play again. We can tinker with that later. I'm probably, I think what I'll want to do is actually draw that inside a box along with the score, and then take the answer and go from there. And then we'll have to have a nice. One thing I was thinking about this, um, most games back in the day didn't really end and take you back to the to the computer. We just didn't think in terms of you know run a program and then the program ends and the computer you know you go back to the to the computer to run another program or something. You just reset the computer because it came up so fast that it, you know rebooting. You just you just press the when you finish playing a game you just press the power switch and and uh, started something else up. Um, so the idea of gracefully shutting down a game and going back to a ready prompt wasn't really that common a thing, but it might be nice to have that just for fun. Um, but in any case, it needs to, if you say no to play again, it needs to do something. It, it doesn't, we don't want to just crash to monitor. That's ugly. So, and by the way, the reason it's putting these L's in here is that the, the kernel is still running and is still checking the keyboard, even though I'm ignoring what it thinks about the keyboard. And it has a 10 character buffer that it uses. And so it is filling that buffer up, even though I'm paying no attention to it. And so that's why when the game breaks out and breaks out to the monitor, the monitor goes ahead and gets what's in that buffer. And that's why sometimes you see L's or H's or J's or whatever showing up there. Um, that's something else we could, we'll, we'll fix in a, in a graceful shutdown is uh, clear that buffer out so that when you come back to a ready prompt or whatever, it doesn't have a bunch of junk in the buffer. Um, and we're up to about an hour already. Um, I guess that's going to be it for this time. Um, I think I'll do another one of these in a couple of days and try to finish this up before another week goes by. Um, because I'd like to get on to another a little more ambitious project. I think the next one we're going to get into sprites um, and bitmaps and more more graphical stuff. Maybe some sound. Although I was never, I never did anything really with sound on the system before, other than some really basic stuff. So that's going to be a, a learning process for me. But uh, that's part of the fun, right? So um, come back next time. Maybe be able to finish this up. Um, get this print numbers routine done. Display the score. Ask if you want to play again, um, exit out gracefully if you don't, and uh, put a bow on it. And then we'll move on to something else. So if you have any questions, um, be sure um, sorry, be sure to hit me up in the comments or, like I said, over at the C128 uh, subreddit. It's also a good place. And I hope this one was informative, and uh, thank you for watching.